ESPN was in this weird place in 05, 06, 07 in a lot of ways. One was creative. They just were all over the map. They're trying reality shows. They're doing these terrible movies. They didn't know whether they were going to, should they try to be like MTV? So all that stuff had kind of played out and they were in this no man's land where ESPN The Zone, ESPN The Gatorade, ESPN 25, which everybody hated, was this super self-congratulatory, look how great we are, ESPN thing. So it was all this stuff like ESPN, 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 and you could really feel a backlash. It was the first time, I think, at that point in the history of the company, there had been a backlash. People were like, you're in my face too much. Back off, ESPN. Fuck ESPN. Sometimes there can be a little bit of natural sort of fraternal rivalry and I'll speak directly at it, there might be some allusion here to the fact that Mr. Simmons occasionally got himself carried away as suggesting he was the creator and he was the guy behind this. And that's not the way our culture works, right? We have a collaborative culture which almost instinctively always says, well, it wasn't me, it was a team. Oh, it wasn't me, it was somebody else. And uh, that's not the culture that most of entertainment gets made in, right? People care a lot about whether their names are on something, and they care a lot about getting a credit and being an executive producer, whether they did anything or not. That's kind of not been our culture. What if I told you, even if you've never seen a single one of ESPN's 30 for 30 sports documentaries, you may find the story of how the award-winning series was conceived and shepherded onto the air to be as fascinating as some of the tales told in the films themselves. Since its debut in 2009, 30 for 30 has made new sports fans of documentary fans, new documentary fans of sports fans, and both of both. The 30 for 30 series was initially attended as a prestigious event designed to celebrate the network's 30th anniversary. But along the way, 30 for 30 became a phenomenon, which catapulted the entire sports documentary genre and nonfiction storytelling to new heights. In a crowded content universe, creating a successful brand that doesn't just stand out, but leaps into the culture's consciousness is no small order. And yet, that's exactly what happened. And much like PTI's journey, this is one fueled not by the sheer mass of ESPN, so much as a small group of men and women who built their own creative biosphere, avoided the always handy, this is how we do things corporate dictum, and as a result, extended the company's breadth and recognition into a new world. So many things today don't operate the way they should, aren't as good as they're supposed to be, or along the way from conception to fruition, unfortunately leave the domain of the passionate and competent. As you listen here, feel free to forget that we're talking about sports and television. Think instead of creative vision, clarity of purpose, and genuine fellowship. This is Origins Chapter 2, ESPN, Episode 4, 30 for 30. Bill Simmons was the co-creator of 30 for 30, and if you are at all familiar with the must-play game of shoots and ladders that he started while an employee of ESPN, you may not be surprised to learn that even before he arrived, he seemed destined for an ESPN career unlike no other. ESPN management has fessed up to the fact that it was an AOL Digital City column Simmons wrote that fueled their desire to hire him, which is ironic given its facetious title. Quote, the 1999 ESPY Awards, Greatest Night in Sports or TV Holocaust? In January of 2012, Deadspin's Barry Pachetsky was kind enough to share some of its highlights for those who didn't get a chance to read it the first time around. Simmons' column featured a timeline of his reactions as he was watching the SB telecast, which started at 8 p.m. 8.03, just slammed my head against the coffee table for 30 seconds. 8.22, Steve Largent reads the Emmy rules, allegedly a comedy segment. I've watched funerals for slain policemen that were packed with more comedy. His final thought? Hell will freeze over before I sit through another SP's telecast. You have to give ESPN management credit for seeing through such savagery to appreciate the talent underneath, even if one would be hard pressed to recall another hiring based on so royal a roasting of a company's product. Simmons joined ESPN in 2001. A year later, he added writing duties on the Jimmy Kimmel show to his itinerary. When I got there, I just wanted to write my column. I was just so happy that somebody had hired me to write a sports column for a bigger audience than I had. That was my goal. And then uh, that led to Jimmy's show and me moving out there and trying to do both at the same time. I was in LA for a while. I didn't understand the power of the column. It was hard to understand. It was the internet. You don't know who you're reaching. 
initially I wanted to use the calm to graduate to like a TV gig or something because that seemed more stable. And then you realize like, oh man, I had a really good foothold here in this place that's going in the right direction. I Maybe that's where I should really try to succeed. I wanted to do my column and really go all in on ESPN. I wanted to do more than the column. John Skipper was named president of ESPN and co-chairman of Disney Media Networks in January of 2012 and resigned in December of 2017. He had arrived at ESPN in 1997, becoming senior vice president and general manager of ESPN The Magazine that same year, then as executive vice president of content from 2005 to 2011. Skipper received his bachelor's degree from the University of North Carolina and a graduate degree in English literature from Columbia University, which may help explain why he is probably one of the best read executives in the media business today. He is often masterful in his business dealings and is known for his Southern charm, as well as a hail fellow, well met kind of charisma that attracts admirers left and right. Lest any of that mislead you, however, keep in mind that Skipper is, above all, complex. He can hold a grudge with the best of them. And while capable of almost unbelievable humility, he is also known for occasional instances of unabashed hubris. Every noteworthy executive has detractors, but whatever nays the sayers may say, no one seems to find anything boring about being or watching John Skipper. I seem to remember a yellow legal pad that you put some thoughts together after Mark Shapiro left and you were preparing to have a conversation with George Bodenheimer Mm -hmm. about taking what would become the head of content job. Mm -hmm. basically. And I'm just wondering that if you were to think back on those notes, and if you remember, is it possible that documentaries was something that was part of it because it was multi-paged? It was, um, I believe, about 12 pages of the long form of legal pad. Uh, Its most important part was about live events. And I remember the World Cup was on there, and I remember talking about the NBA. I remember talking about what we wanted to do with studio shows. I have to tell you, frankly, I do not know if documentaries was on there or not. I do know that it included that we were not going to be doing scripted dramas and we were not going to be doing a lot of reality series. That I was interested in live events. First of all, I was interested in expanding Sports Center. I was interested in doing content where we could clearly do the best content there was. I'd had at one point hopes of being a storyteller either a feature writer or a novelist. I want to be an editor. So it's what I care about most in the world is is uh, telling stories. And so it certainly was part of that 11 or 12 pages that we wanted to be telling stories. We lean more into hiring long-form journalists at ESPN.com, which John Walsh and I had done from 2000 to 2005, we had hired Hunter Thompson, and we'd hired David Halberstam, we'd hired Bill Simmons, and a bunch of other magazine writers who did long-form feature writing, Wright Thompson. We really wanted to do more of that, and I wanted to bring that to television. If 30 for 30 had a grandfather, his name would be John A. Walsh. First hired as a consultant in the late 80s by then ESPN president Steve Bornstein, Walsh was the chief architect for SportsCenter's reimagination in Golden Era and he was inescapably present at creation for ESPN Radio and ESPN The Magazine. Often as sort of minister without portfolio, Walsh was nothing if not colorful, but he was no actor. If he didn't believe in you, his time with you would be short. But if he was a fan, he would make himself available to you 24-7, something he began doing early on with Bill Simmons. But when John Skipper and I went to ESPN.com, we hired this rebel-rousing columnist, Bill Simmons, and Bill became very popular with his columns, which were really creative in those early days of page two on ESPN.com. One of the really funny times was uh, when Bill Simmons was starting to write his columns and there was a question of language taste in a couple of issues. And Bill would, I remember being with him once and he just shook his head. You ran Rolling Stone. (laughs) How come this can't run? And I said, you know, it's a different time, a different era, different medium, whatever. So at the end of 2006, my contract was coming up. And I was starting to feel, at that point, I was in my mid-30s. I loved doing the column. I felt like I could still get better at it. But I also felt like, creatively, just writing a column and being in front of your computer all day is pretty lonely. And I really wanted to do stuff where I was with other people. That was the one thing I loved the most. So... 
January 2007, Skipper took me to the Rose Bowl with my wife and my young daughter. And we spent the day with him at the Rose Bowl and then went back to his hotel and we banged out what my contract would be. And the big thing for me was how do I get more involved on the creative side? You've been talking to Walsh, though, too. As I've been talking it. to Walsh a lot. And that was the culmination of all those conversations. It's like, I think I could help. I think I could maybe create shows and work on stuff. I remember I had sent them memos a lot. I would send them memos about why is the NBA studio show this bad? Here's what I think we should do with the website. I look at it now, and, it, and I probably sent too many. But that's just how I was wired. I was like, we should do this. We should do that. Why don't we do this? Why is this like this? And I think that's why... Skipper really kind of enjoyed the emails for a long time. Was it, you know, made him think sometimes. But who did you send them out to? Skipper and Walsh every right. time. So they signed me. That spring was when I came up with the 30 for 30 idea. The two tent poles of that idea were one, I knew we had the anniversary coming. So this is two years ahead of time. We'd be like, this is a hook. ESPN, 30th anniversary. They love celebrating themselves. How do we get creative and how do we do something that we haven't done before? Is there a way to celebrate ourselves that won't antagonize people? And then the second part was, why is HBO own the sports documentary space? How did this happen? We're the worldwide leader. We have the rights to everything. Why do they own sports documentaries? Why not us? Ezra Edelman is an acclaimed filmmaker and the Academy Award winning director of ESPN's OJ Made in America. I worked at a place as a staff employee at HBO that did sports documentaries. And so it was very fluid within my existence to have been able to, and fortunate to have had the opportunity to almost graduate to having the opportunity to to work in documentaries. I did three documentaries there. The first one was called Ghost of Flatbush about the Brooklyn Dodgers and then Matching and Bird and Kurt Flood. But I also thought that was a point where the style with which documentaries were done at HBO, which were all narrator driven, all narrated by Leah Schreiber, who is wonderful. He's the best in the business. I think there was a realization that there was a limit to how I could make films there in that place. And so in essence, maybe the type of subject matter in terms of the things I was interested in was broadening, but in terms of my ability to execute those things and really sort of do things differently and challenging creatively was actually maybe not growing. And that was one reason why I was trying to figure out how to you know, get out into the world and sort of challenge yourself creatively to do bigger and different things. Mark Shapiro had been doing some documentaries. You know, he did media doc. I mean, he did uh, Dick Shep. He did Frank DeFord. He did Neil Leifer. All really good documentaries. But it it was never like an ongoing commitment. There were one-offs to a certain degree that Mark had figured out how to fit into the budget and fit into the programming schedule, which is not an easy feat. I'd had Mr. Simmons in my ear and... Pardon the interruption. About Skipper once again referring to Bill Simmons as Mr. Simmons. Let's get this out of the way early. Apart from John Walsh, it'd be tough to find an ESPN employee with whom Skipper enjoyed a more stimulating dynamic than he did with Simmons. The two men hit it off early and shared a near father-son relationship, traveling together on company and personal business. All was golden until more than a decade into the relationship, when a nasty cold front blew in and created a pall over both team and spirit. Soon thereafter, following months of agonizing estrangement, Simmons would learn, via Twitter, that Skipper had coldly announced to the New York Times that he would not be renewing Simmons' contract. There are roughly half a dozen Shakespeare plays that track their narrative, which remains frosty to this day. In fact, when Powerhouse was published, I was able to get former CA partners Ron Meyer and Michael Ovitz together for a wide-ranging Q&A that the three of us did at the Directors Guild in Los Angeles. Meyer and Ovitz hadn't been seen together in public for 21 years prior to that night. The next day, I emailed Skipper and Simmons and wrote, Hey, let's raise some money for the V Foundation and do the same thing. The responses were quick. Those two dogs were not going to hunt together again, at least not for the moment. Now back to our story. Mr. Simmons was often in my ear and John Walsh's ear about the HBO documentaries and that being a place to go and how it felt like there was an opportunity to do something different, to do something a little more creative. And I don't mean this in a pejorative way it's sometimes used. It was formulaic, right? It was Lee Schreiber and it was had kind of a way they did things and they picked topics because they wanted to reach a big audience. Again, it sounds more pejorative than I mean it. That felt 
obvious, right? They did bird and magic. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. That's good. But we were looking to think about ultimately uh, quirkier things. Were you a fan of HBO docs? Had you watched them growing I wasn't. up? And- so the biggest problem HBO had and the, the way they were the most susceptible was they were old documentaries. They were documentaries about people like Vince Lombardi and Joe Lewis and Joe DiMaggio and Mickey Mantle. And they just always were old. And they weren't making documentaries for people like me and people who were younger than me. I really sold the anniversary part and I sold the HBO corner part because I knew how competitive Skipper was. The best way to get anything with Skipper is to, he's a really competitive guy. You just appeal to that. Why aren't we good at this? We can win this. That's how you kind of get him. Bill began to hound John Skipper, who then had taken over content about, hey, why does ESPN leave sports documentaries to HBO? Why are they just let them have the franchise? And he kept hounding, and there was never a reaction from either Skipper or me that satisfied Bill. And rightfully so, because we really didn't take an aggressive part. I did have sort of a casual management style. And remember the most startling thing about my getting that job is I went from no experience in television. I had not produced a moment of television to being in charge of content at the company that produced more television than any other company in the world. So I was naive about some things. But one thing that it forced me to be was open to people's ideas because I didn't know how to do it. I knew what I wanted to do. I knew that I wanted ESPN to do a news show, right? I loved Outside the Lines as a daily show. I wanted to do a a weekly magazine show and admired 60 Minutes, which is why I got called E60. But yeah, and of course, I wasted a fair amount of time. I got pitched a lot of different things and people came in, but it also was heady, right? It was fun. Back in 2007, Connor Shell was, at 28, the proverbial upstart at ESPN, albeit one who arrived packing a ton of ambition, as well as a history degree from Harvard and an MBA from Columbia. ESPN Original Entertainment had been in the narrative film space, right? Had been making made-for-television movies for a period of, I don't know, four or five years. There was an excellent made-for-television film about Dale Earnhardt. There was a not-so-excellent one about Pete Rose and a few others, right? And there was a changing of the guard at ESPN, which allowed to vocalize what I believed was an opportunity, which was we owned, or I I believe this is true, ESPN and ABC owned the largest sports library in the world. Why were we going out and paying actors and writers to recreate stories for sports fans who demand authenticity, right? That's the number one thing when you put content in front of a sports fan is they start with, is this realistic? Do I believe it? And so why were we trying to create fictionalized versions of real things that had happened when we could just create the real thing that happened? John Skipper and I had had that conversation a few times And he let me, and this one I don't know why, but he let me run off and sort of create this little group ESPN Films. And we started the process of making documentary films at ESPN. George Bodenheimer was president of ESPN, and if the company ever decided to sculpt a Mount Rushmore of its own, he would be a first ballot, no doubt unanimous selection. I think you have to look back all the way to 2001, when under Mark Shapiro's leadership at the time, we created ESPN Original Entertainment. We were trying new things, uh, scripted dramas, made for television films, you know, Bronx is Burning, Junction Boys, to name a couple. EOE had a great run for about six years. Uh, then Skipper, you know, took over, and we started producing, you know, one off documentaries. That was really the first efforts for ESPN in that area. So the timing was almost, you know, serendipitous. I'd been pitched at ESPN Films a long-form narrative on basketball by Dan Clores. Then I brought Keith Klingscales into it, a woman named Joan Lynch, and we decided to do about a five-hour documentary called Black Magic, which was about the history of the historical black colleges and universities, what basketball was like there before integration. When we put that one on the air and saw the reaction to it, It was incredibly powerful, not just from a ratings perspective. It had this amazing 
brand halo on the whole place, and it mattered and it made an impact. Shell was so fond of and admiring of Simmons that he felt no need or desire to compete with him. Simmons, for his part, wanted to be not just a force within ESPN, but a leader and mentor as well. Thus, in a near perfect Jerry Maguire sort of way, the two completed each other. I knew Connor only because he was this young guy at ESPN. It was called EOE at that point. And they did this documentary about, I think, the Cosmos. Remember the New York Cosmos? Yeah. Davies did that documentary. And either I saw it and liked it or he sent it. To, I can't remember. But it ended up with an email to me from Connor. Hey, my name's Connor. Blah, blah, blah. And we just started, be, we became kind of email buddies. He was young. He's, you know, had been reading my column for a while. And we just kind of got to know each other. Bill has, to this day, the most sort of insatiable creative energy of, why don't we do this? What if we do this? Have you thought about this? Let's do this, right? And Bill's always been interested in how you build businesses and why isn't this working? And, you know, we were a good match for each other in sort of trying to explain things we neither of us understood we'd explain to each other, right? I came up with the 30 for 30 idea in a memo that I sent to them. And I laid out this blueprint. I had the title, which was, I somehow came up with the title and it was like my favorite thing about it. It was 30 for 30. 30 documentaries for 30 years. It just made sense. I'm a big title guy and I just felt like that has a ring to it. That's something. So I forwarded the memo to Connor and I said, what do you think of this? Skipper and Walsh, I actually think they're fired up about this. When did I first hear about 30 for 30? I mean, I, I was... The answer would be when Bill and I sat in his backyard and came up with it. We had connected on a lot of things over a friendship of a period of a few years and had sort of talked about this hole that existed in the sports world and the media world generally about long-form nonfiction storytelling on television. I mean, we, we thought that that was a big opportunity. We were talking about how we felt we could make an impact on this landscape in significant ways. So we started working on it. Connor flew out. It was like April or May. I didn't know him that well. I had maybe had drinks with him once. He flew out. I had just bought a new house, but I still had the old house. And I had this little guest house in the old house. And he came over for six hours. And we sat in that guest house and we sketched out the entire series. I will always remember that day because that was heaven for me, right? I was nobody and i'm sitting in bill simmons backyard talking about sports and what do we like and what's interesting and do you remember this and i love bo jackson and he was talking about the 86 masters and we're just bouncing around with all these things and bill's got his laptop out and he's writing all these things down and at the end of the day we had a list of just here's a bunch of topics we're really interested in and i didn't really know what we were going to do with that it was just we're trying to frame some big project and then he started to think about, okay, what if we tied this to the 30th anniversary? And what if we said we were going to do 30 stories? And I, again, because I had almost no knowledge of how these things actually work, didn't realize how big and ambitious and ridiculous that was, right? We sketched out all the best docs we thought we can do, like the best ideas. I remember like I was obsessed with Doc Good and Daryl Strawberry, which we ended up not even doing. But it was like all these like no brainer, like four days in October. I had the title at that point. It was like four, these four Yankee games should be a documentary. Like HBO would do the whole season right. and they would tie it into the curse of the Bambino and all that. So I was like, the documentary is actually these four games. That should be it. Then you're out. And Walsh had some notes, obviously. He was like, ah, you got to have this, you got to have that. His whole thing was, well, if you're going to do that, you got to have, you got to cover this, this, this. And I was like, no, I, I think you're wrong. I think the whole point of this is it's 30 stories. It's not, we're not ranking these. That was another thing that was in the memo. It's like everything ESPN was doing is ranking. You know, it's like, here are the 100 best athletes ever. Here are the 25 most important. I was like, we're not doing that with this. So let's just tell 30 stories. There are two key early moments in the 30 for 30 origin story. One was Simmons coming up with an idea to go deep for documentaries and use them to celebrate ESPN's 30th anniversary. The second came from Shell, and it can be likened perhaps to Christopher Columbus asking, why don't we use ships? And then he said, why couldn't we get 30 filmmakers? Why would we do any of these? Why don't we just outsource all of them? And I was like, can we do that? Because I didn't know how much stuff costs. And he's like, yeah, we could just go get 30 filmmakers. I was doing development work across the company 
in the original entertainment space. And I felt like I had fairly unique perspective on the power of the platform. I mean, I go back to the idea that we reach sports fans and we reach massive amounts of sports fans. And if you are a storyteller, no matter who you are, if you're good at it, your primary motivation is to have the story that you're telling be consumed, have it be read, have it be watched, have it be enjoyed and appreciated. And we could offer that to people, right? We could say, we're making a commitment to this genre. And again, now nonfiction is everywhere and there's platforms everywhere and everyone's sort of making this commitment to multi-part series and documentaries are everywhere. In 2007, that was not the case. And by the way, the economy was bad. And the idea that we were going to make a commitment to a genre that very few others had made a commitment to, and we we're going to do it in a big way and reach people, right? And take high-end documentaries, which what we had the vision of creating, out of art house theaters and make them mass consumption. That's a very appealing pitch. And I guess early on, I was pretty passionate about the idea that that, that would work. Certainly in the background, was this 25th anniversary celebration, which was quite successful, but was really a 25 great years of this, 25 greatest coaches, here's what we did. So there was a sense that we didn't want to repeat that. And then somewhere somebody had the idea. Well, first came 30, the idea to do 30 films, 30 for 30, which somehow came from some combination of Bill Simmons, John Walsh, and Connor Shell said, hey, and they brought it to me and said, what do you think about doing 30? Now we're back to where you were asking. It was okay to walk in the office and say something. By the way, business was good, really good. And and we didn't have a whole lot of process. We didn't run a bunch of P&Ls. We just said, that's a great idea. Let's do that. Well, now, the price tag was $15 million, right? So you're doing 500000 per for 30. So that, at least at some point, you did have to ask George, right? Because I believe George signed off on it. George did sign off on it, right. but uh, he was extraordinarily great about caring about the idea and about trusting the people who work for him. And $15 million, while a significant price tag, wasn't a terrible price tag for 30th anniversary celebration. I don't know what the 25th anniversary t- price tag was, but probably in the same neighborhood. It's not the billions that you talk about in terms of acquisitions for rights fees and whatever, but $15 million for original programming is $15 million. So I assume it wasn't a request that you took lightly. No, $15 million is is $15 million. But, uh, you know, I loved it. We roll around to uh, 2009, our 30th anniversary. We were looking to do something more meaningful than simply throw another party So we decided to uh, do 30,000 hours of community service. We honored the 43 people that had been at ESPN since 1979 with a wonderful ceremony, which you chronicled well in in your book, Jim. We opened our L.A. facility and moved the Lake Sports Center there. So it it was a perfect timing to say, let's try something new. And, of course, out of the management team that Skipper was running, the creative team, that included Bill Simmons and Connor Shell and John Dahl and Marie Donahue, you know, led by Skip. They came up with this idea for 30 documentaries. And, you know, I loved it because it, it kept the creative juices flowing. It was an easy thing for me to say yes. I was empowered to say yes. And we said, yes, let's do it. I remember the day that I actually received a phone call from John Skipper saying, we're going to do this. That was May 16th, 2007, uh, which also ironically was my 30th birthday. So he greenlit 30 for 30 on my 30th birthday. And from that point on, I was with John Walsh two or three hours every week, just figuring out exactly how we were going to attack each part of this. And then beyond that, I was talking to Simmons three, four, five times a day and exchanging these ridiculously long emails with him. When you got the go-ahead from Skipper and Walsh, did you at any point say, Listen, we got to control this. No, like, I wasn't smart enough. I didn't know anything. I to me, it was like it was never going to happen. It was it was right. just fun to work on, but it was like a pipe dream. And at that point, like they had signed Riley, 
it was a little bit antagonistic because they had kind of locked me up and then given Riley this giant contract and then given him the back page ESPN magazine. So I was a little mad about that. I had started to work on my basketball book and this was just another thing we were kind of working on but wasn't sure it was going to happen. Connor was doing a lot of the legwork on trying to figure out if this could actually work. And it got to a point near the end of 2007 when it was like, this is something. You were pretty upset after they canceled the Obama podcast. I was. It was the most, until uh, I got suspended, it was the worst thing that happened to me because I knew the guy was going to be president and the reasons didn't add up. And I was just like, wow. And then a couple months later, all of a sudden, Riley's doing a column with him and he's with Chris Berman. It's like, well, what happened? You told me it was hands off. And now all of a sudden, all these other areas. So I, I really took that personally. And I took the summer off and worked on my basketball book and tried to finish that and really worked my ass off on it. And Connor and a bunch of our other people were meeting with directors. Friday, April 25th, 2008. A pivotal all hands on deck meeting took place during the Tribeca Film Festival at the Ritz Carlton Hotel down near Battery Park in New York City. Suite 717 to be exact. Even though Skipper had approved the 30 for 30 idea with support from Bodenheimer, there were still people at the company intent on derailing it. This was the gathering where different facets of the company would weigh in. The business side of the equation would need to make sense and a strong architecture for the entire project would have to be convincingly sold to the room. If you were one of those who wanted to kill the idea of using 30 for 30 to celebrate the company's 30th anniversary or just kill it altogether, this was probably your last best shot. The stakes, as they say, were high. So the big meeting was spring 2008, April, Battery Park, Ritz-Carlton, New York City. And I feel bad about this, but at the time, Connor and I were so suspicious of everyone and so protective of this idea that we were trying to box people out. And Walsh loved Dahl, and, and Walsh was like, you got to get John Dahl on this. And we were like, no, we're, we just we didn't want anybody involved. We, we felt like the more chefs in the kitchen, it would get screwed up. And so by the time we got to this Battery Park meeting, it's really interesting because we have... You have Bob Wallace, who was running EOE at the time, who was this bizarre, really nice guy, but just a bizarre hire. He had been like a Rolling Stone connection to Skipper and Walsh and didn't really have a ton of TV experience. And he's in there. And then you had like the Norby and all those kind of people in there. And a lot of the people in the room didn't want the idea to happen. And why was that? Because it wasn't their idea. And because they weren't involved on the ground floor of it. And because, um, you know, if ESPN commits to this, then they're not committing to something that maybe one of these people would like. So we really had to sell the idea. And this is at a time, though, when Walsh has juice. Walsh has a ton of juice, and we have Walsh. So we have Walsh, which means we probably have Skipper, but we have to go through the process of selling this to the room. So we do it. And people are trying to subtly undermine it. Everybody's trying to grab a piece, you know, kind of sway it and it's well what, 15 million that's incredible i mean nobody does that and well how are we going to schedule this and are, are you sure you have the ad sales and and uh well wouldn't it be better if we took the money and put it here and all, people are asking all the right questions if they kind of don't want this to work and we just had an answer for everything connor had that's when i knew connor was going to be something because every single thing is like well here's our solution for this well here's our solution for this every single piece that could potentially fall through with this idea. He had figured out the business reasons why this could work. We figured out 500,000 per documentary for the filmmakers. We figured out how to get it paid for potentially with ad sales. We figured out the scheduling, which is a really big problem because ESPN had so many games. Dave Burson was still there at that point who was really helpful. We had a suite at the Ritz Carlton at Battery Park. It was a big meeting. And uh, we decided at that point we were going to do 30 films for the 30th anniversary. We were going to use 30 filmmakers. Bill Simmons had written a memo suggesting that we do 10 films that were the greatest players, 10 films that were the greatest coaches, 10 films that were the greatest things that had happened in the 30 years. And that may not be right, but it was sort of three sets of 10 films that were sort of thematic. And was a great idea and it's in a way what we did but we didn't do it quite that programmatically what we did instead at that meeting i remember there being a big whiteboard 
because we started in 79, there was sort of the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and the zeros. And then you sort of put sports down one side, and we sort of put individual athletes and teams. We were quite cognizant that we wanted to tell a mosaic, not a chronological history, not a comprehensive history. Nobody felt like we had to do everything. One of the brilliant things about the construct was this is over 30 years, but we're not saying here's the 1980 story, here's the 1981 story. We're not saying here are the top 10 athletes. We're not ranking people. We're not counting them down. But if somebody watched all 30, they'd get a pretty good idea of the issues and stories that mattered over 30 years. And you would have hit a lot of different sports and a lot of different eras and a lot of different types of people. And Walsh really pushed on that issue. And then he always pushed on the idea that just you can come up with the most brilliant framework in the world. You can come up with the best ideas in the world, but they better fucking be good, right? They better be well executed and quality really, really matters. And by the end of it, it was clear they had to do the idea and it was done. So they greenlit it and we went and got drinks after. At that point, you know, people were psyched. The people on our little team, because it was like, holy shit, like that we're going to do this. But yeah, I still never a hundred percent felt like it was going to happen. I was never of the mindset of like, wow, if I leave ESPN, I'm not going to be there when 30 for 30 launches. I still felt like the rug was going to get pulled out from under us. This is Parachute CEO. She goes on vacation in Europe and on the way home, she basically starts to think about hunting down sheets and she can't find them and then she starts a company. And then all of a sudden she's doing towels and now they're into table linens. Oh my God. I, I think she's going to be taking over Facebook soon. Um, <laughs> but uh, this time, instead of uh, Portugal, now the table linens, of course, when you think of table linens, you think of Italy. So here we go. They got a world-class Italian factory. And uh, the, the factory's been going for more than 80 years. And now it's cranking out beautiful parachute table linens. You could set your table with it or give it as a gift. Well, how about this? I'll see your table linens and I'll raise you some baby bedding. Don't tell me. Jim, I'm dead serious. A buddy of mine has a little baby. They just bought parachute baby bedding. Actually, it makes sense because, look, I remember when each of my three kids came home from the hospital. The most important thing is, you know, what you're going to put them down on. Yep. So the idea that there's going to be these natural and safe sheets that feel great, I think that's probably a pretty smart move on their yeah, part. Yeah, that is a good move. Visit parachutehome.com slash Arjuns and get your free shipping and returns on any of Parachute's amazing products. That's parachutehome.com dot com slash origins for free shipping and returns. By now, you've heard many talk of the amazing shave they get from Dollar Shave Club razors, especially when used with their Dr. Carver shave butter. Now, you can add even more DSC products to your daily routine. Dollar Shave Club makes products for your hair, your face, skin, shower, everything you need. They will have you looking and feeling amazing. And it's all their own original stuff. They only use the finest premium ingredients and they deliver it to you just like they do their razors. That means no more annoying trips to the store, cruising up and down aisles, looking at shelf upon shelf of, what the hell is that and what do I do with it? You can use Dollar Shave Club for just about everything. They will have you covered head to toe. And with gift memberships and e-gift cards available, DSC can help cover the names of your holiday shopping list too. We want you to love Dollar Shave Club as much as millions do. So we've arranged for you to try your first month of their best razor, along with travel-sized versions of shave butter, body cleanser, and yes, even wipes, for just $5. After that, replacement cartridges ship for just a few bucks a month. It's the DSC starter set. Get yours for just 5 bucks, exclusively at dollarshaveclub.com slash origins. That's dollarshaveclub.com slash origins. Origins is made possible by you. Who are you? We know that you downloaded the podcast, but we really don't know anything about you. The folks who support this show would love to know just a little bit about who is listening. If you have two minutes, it really does only take two minutes, help us make the show an even better experience for you by telling us more about yourself. Just go to Listener Q, L-I-S-T-E-N-E-R-Q.com forward slash origins and take the short survey. You can also give us direct feedback about the show which we would love to hear. And as a thank you, you'll be entered into a drawing for a $100 Amazon gift certificate. Two minutes, that's it. 
listenerq.com slash origins. That's listenerq.com slash origins. Despite Simmons' earlier concerns about opening things up so others could join the team, only now did the urgency of the formal go-ahead and the encroaching time crunch assert themselves. Other team members would have to be brought on board because there was one mere year to go to get the films made. The key addition to the 30 for 30 force was John Dahl, a documentary veteran. I was like, wow, that's going to be ambitious, you know, to do 30 films. And I think it was just like the perfect convergence of three people. <laughs> like, you know, Bill is so creative and such a risk taker and speaks for the fan and speaks like a fan and is an absolutely amazing and entertaining writer. You know, and he, it was initially him having this inspiration about what do we do for ESPN's 30th anniversary, talking to Connor. And then Connor is an outstanding strategist. I mean, he really can see the big picture and he can, you know, understand what is going to resonate, you know. And I think Connor really set a tone for what 30 for 30 was going to be. I think what I brought was production experience. I had been working on those kinds of projects at that point for a decade. So I had been through Sports Century relentless, tireless, you know, over 50 hours of programs on the 20th century in sports. Then the next year at Classic, I actually oversaw 54 Sports Century documentaries on Classic the next year. I didn't think my life could be any busier than, you know, the late 90s. 2000 was insane. And then after that, I oversaw a project called ESPN 25. We did over 30 hours of programming on the 25 years of the ESPN era. I had done a Super Bowl at 40 project. I'd done a NASCAR project. <laughs> I'd done an Ali project. So I cut my teeth in all these big form projects. So what I brought was like that decade of experience of like taking something like, okay, 30 films on the air and you know, just over a year. How are we going to do that? How are we going to pull that off? And that's what I think we all complemented each other really well. I think Bill, Connor, and I just fit kind of perfectly. John Dahl was the more established filmmaker and somebody who'd made more documentaries and his contribution is often underestimated. John Dahl knows as much about the mechanics of taking footage and making a great documentary out of it as anybody. And he's one of those guys who he can do it himself, but he may actually be more skilled at doing it with other people. Thank God John Dahl was involved because he had actual experience in making films. I mean, Bill and I didn't know what we were doing. Did you feel like you guys were creating your own biosphere for this, or did you feel like it was important for you to be integrated into the network? So I think the answer to a lot of these things as I think back is I was really young and inexperienced and naive to a lot of the politics that may have existed. I mean, I really... Did it prove advantageous, by the way? Uh, totally. I mean, right. because I didn't know how to limit the thinking, right? And neither did Bill, right? Bill had never done this. So it wasn't... We could have conversations about what we wanted to do. And your mind wasn't immediately saddled with, well, here's 45 reasons why that will never work, right? Which I always today try and make sure that I don't enter that frame of mind because I know how much I benefited from the idea of saying like, like, this is absurd. You, this is an, a, an absurd notion that we're going to go get 30 incredible high-end storytellers to work, in many cases, at a loss over the course of two years of their lives to tell these passion projects about sports for this series. And we will have no format to any of it. And we will somehow find a way to thread it all together to tell this cohesive, larger story. We didn't know how to tell ourselves that that wasn't a good idea. We just thought it was a good idea. So we pursued it. I think we benefited from the notion of being separate. We benefited from the notion of being able to build our own team. And we also greatly benefited from this incredible bridge that John Walsh, as a conduit to John Skipper, but that John Walsh provided us of he knew, oh, okay, you're thinking about that. Why don't you call this person? They were in the newsroom that day. Why don't you call this person? They covered that story. And that was an unbelievable resource. Walsh had dramatic credibility at the company, right? I mean, really the guy who'd reinvented SportsCenter. He was kind of my editorial consigliere. We kind of 
ran together on this stuff. We'd started the magazine together. We had we had relaunched and had a great deal of success with ESPN.com. But when we were doing .com and we brought uh, Hunter Thompson in, there were a lot of I'm sure there were a lot of rolled eyes in Bristol. I wasn't working in Bristol, so I didn't have to see them. And I'm sure that people weren't quite sure in some cases why we brought this guy, Bill Simmons, in. Right? He didn't play by all the rules of journalism, and he was an open fan, and he was sort of reinventing one way to write about sports. And there was some resistance, and resistance which Bill wasn't really prepared to mollify by coming in and being part of that culture because he – regards himself. I did myself for a long time as a sort of a quintessential outsider, right? Not wanting to be part of something establishmentarian. I guess that actually is the definition of anti-establishmentarian. Was there, you know, at a 30,000 foot level, a message from you to Walsh and Connor and Bill saying, look, the pedigree of this project still has to be something that we want to keep as high as possible. I mean, was that part of the mission? I didn't really need to worry because... John is a relentless improver and editor. In fact, one of my jobs in terms of the partnership of my job with John was to tell John when to stop because John would continue to change things forever and they would always be better. But at the magazine, I know John would call me and I'd say, John, we're on press. It's already printing. And he'd say, well, but how many have we printed? Because if we could just get this sentence changed, it would be better. I'm like, John, it's printed. Man, this, we're not, no, we're not going to change. We're not stopping the press to change this sentence. We're moving on. Connor put together this elaborate chart of here's how we're going to cover all the different sports. Here's how we're going to demonstrate diversity. Here's how we're going to have whatever amount of appropriate gender equity are going to be in these documentaries about women. And then you had to have a diversity among the people who were producing them. And you also had to have some sense if it was going to be 30 years, you couldn't do 20 of them on the last five years. or So you had to spread them out over 30 years. We had this elaborate chart of filling in all the boxes to meet all the demands that it would take to be equal opportunity, diverse, really interesting storytelling documentaries. And Bill was in on the early feedback and development of some ideas, but really 30 for 30 was made by Connor Shell and John Dahl for years. This is where Connor really took over because at that point, Skipper Walsh was like, yeah, go ahead. It's just me and Connor. There's nobody else. And we start kind of talking to people. And at that point, ESPN had no cachet whatsoever with Hollywood. To Hollywood and to any filmmaker, ESPN was creatively dead. And the place that did shitty movies. And really, you're going to, now you're doing documentaries and you're going to empower us. And it just, nobody was buying it. I had, with the help of Dan Silver, and a young woman named Deirdre Fenton, we'd sort of started this ESPN Films group. And Libby Geis joined the team right around then. She came over and began working with us. Libby Geis started her career as an assistant to director Dan Clores at his Shoot the Moon production company and worked on Black Magic, Clores' remarkable film about urban roots in basketball. After finishing work on that project, she decided to spend all her money traveling to Argentina. When all her money was no more, Geis came back to New York and met with Connor Shell. Her timing was perfect. 30 for 30 was just being born. We knew we wanted to retain all rights. And so we need it. When a filmmaker comes, we need you to clear all means of media worldwide perpetuity. We don't know what the hell the sports landscape or the media landscape will look like. So when you go to the NFL or Major League Baseball or some of the most expensive rights holders in the world and say, we need this forever, those price tags are a little heftier than expected. I remember the Steinbrenner film with Barbara Koppel, you know, we just didn't know, I think, going in, if you shot, even if she shot an interview that was at Yankee Stadium, MLB could claim ownership of that. There was another great idea that came out, which was, we're going to do a contract. Marie Donahue might have had something to do with this. We're going to do a contract, and we're going to get all rights into perpetuity, all the footage has to be cleared, and we're going to pay everybody $500,000. And we got a contract, and you're going to sign it. We did that partially because we didn't have time. We have time to negotiate 30 different contracts. 
I think we learned a lot of lessons in the first few films. You know, if we're going to ask filmmakers for those kind of rights and if they're going to have to go around, you know, begging for those rights, we've got to pay for them. So our budgets went up a little bit after that. ESPN is indeed a male-dominated environment, but that didn't wind up inhibiting or thwarting the determined misguised. You know, I don't know how other women feel about me saying this, and I know experiences are different everywhere. I can tell you I have been shown nothing but respect at ESPN and with, you know, working on sports docs in, uh, you know, it's funny, we, I worked, was so lucky to work with Barbara Koppel on her Steinbrenner 30 for 30. And she and I had a really interesting conversation about her interviews with athletes. And she said, you know, there's something about talking to a woman where they sort of sit down and take a breath and I think they open up to me more, you know, they give me a different answer than they would at the press conference. And and I sort of have always looked at it as, oh, you know, this is going to be hard for me and I've got to work harder. But I kind of believed that in her. And I think I'd been to film festivals. I had experience in the outside documentary world. And I think immediately my bosses sort of said, oh, well, you're a valuable asset here as we're trying to bring something new to ESPN. And so... Um, have encouraged me. I don't know. I've just never felt the pressures of being a woman in sports media. And I know I'm incredibly lucky to say that. But my position, I care about good storytelling. I care about finding great voices. And I've always been respected for being good at that. In addition to making the pitch, getting the green light and assembling the unit to make 30 for 30 happen, Shell, Simmons, Dahl, and the rest of the team also had to hire directors who would actually make these films a reality. And they wanted the filmmakers to have real passion about the individual projects they'd be creating for 30 for 30. You know, when we did Sports Century, we had a formula. And it worked beautifully. Like, we got a Peabody Award and Emmys, and it was great. Had a certain look. Every interview, every, the way the stories were told, there was a consistency to it. 30 for 30 was a 180 from that. This was about the individual style of the filmmaker, their passion, their experiences. And we wanted a different look and a different feel for every story. One of my favorite stories about all this was we were in a room once. We were trying to figure out what to do with OJ. We only had, these were all supposed to be an hour. So I was like, you can't do OJ in an hour. Like, what? so what's, so uh, we had like, there's like 10 people around this conference room. And it was like, well, what else happened that day? The car chase, what day was that? June 17th. What else happened on June 17th? Somebody goes on Google. Oh, the Rangers Stanley Cup Parade. Oh, Arnold Palmer's last Masters. Oh, the Knicks finals. And it was just all these things part of it. It was like, is that a documentary or are we crazy? So then you go and you get um, Brett Morgan and you throw a couple ideas at him. He gets excited about that one. That was, I thought, one of the best 30 for 30s of that first series was because he did it just the footage. It was really creative. Like yeah. You have to remember, like at that point, everybody was doing documentaries the exact same way. It was all that HBO model and Liev Schreiber and the bad narration. And we really started to get convinced that this was going to work because once we started to realize that every filmmaker was going to have their own style, and it was like, this is going to be cool. Some of them won't totally work. Some of them will work, but everyone's going to feel different and they're going to be able to complement each other. One of the first phone calls in this whole thing was to Barry Levinson. So I get in touch with Barry. I explain in broad strokes what we're doing. And I say, if you're at all interested, here's my contact number, we should get together. And, and he calls back, and Barry and I went out to lunch. And obviously, I knew going in his connection to Baltimore and all these things, but he went there. And he was really interested in Cal Ripken. But then he also said, but I have this other story that I've been carrying around forever. Very early in the conversation, I said, you know, I've always been fascinated by the Baltimore Colts marching band. And then I sort of told them the thumbnail of the story, you know, like the band that wouldn't die, that for 12 years they marched without a team. And uh, <laughs> they were intrigued. And what was so great at that time was there wasn't anything more than that conversation that I had. It wasn't like, well, let's put a proposal together. Uh, why don't you write, you know, a seven-page outline? Or and there was nothing. It was, it was nothing more than the band that wouldn't die. They just kept marching. And I told them a couple of little anecdotes that I had heard, and they said, oh, that's great, let's do that. It was that simple. Even at your level with feature films, you had a level of autonomy with the documentary that you could never have with a big budget Hollywood picture, correct? It was very, very open and free, whether I was doing, you know, Homicide, or whether I was doing a feature film or a documentary. You know, you're telling a story. 
in, in the case of a documentary, you're telling a true story. Any way that you can tell it is the way to tell the story. You know, it doesn't matter if it's a big budget, small budget, none of it matters. It's, it's how do you tell the story? And we discovered a lot of things that none of us knew because once we started talking to some people, even when we were on, when they were filming it, and they would talk about something and then we'd go look into it. Like I did not know that they hid the uniforms in a cemetery in a, you know, one of those mosques, you know, I had no idea that's where they kept the, the uniforms. <laughs> and I was like, what? It was like one crazy story after another. And this is all real. That's what was so great about it. They were telling me stories that were not talking about watching the game or anything. They were talking about keeping this band alive for 12 years and all that went with it. It was, in a sense, this love affair of this team that was taken out in the middle of the night and uh, the commitment that these people had and this band. And the story was better than the story I told the guys because some of the revelations were extraordinary. You know, I told them the idea. They said, great, let's make it. And I went ahead, I shot it, I gave it to them. And it was like terrific. That's it, you know. It wasn't like a whole, you know, uh, you're going through all these different levels of people and you're talking to this person thinks this and this. It was literally that straight ahead and that simple. It was a great experience, great experience. It couldn't, you can't ask for better than, than those guys. But I have to tell you, when I heard that Bashadi, who was the Ravens' owner, allowed it to be shown at the stadium on a big jumbotron, and people came in and sat on the grass there watching the documentary. And the response was so strong that what happened is when they played the original band, you know, the Baltimore Colts fight song, the people went crazy over it. And that's how they ended up changing the Ravens fight song back to the Colts fight song. John Zeman called me and he says, you're not going to believe this. We're now taking the Ravens fight song and it's not going to be the Colts fight song. <laughs> you know, we're going back to it. That like shocked me. That's a great legacy. <laughs> it's like one of those kind of gratifying sort of, you know, stories. I mean, the result of it all. I remember thinking when I first saw the Barry Levinson Baltimore Colts movie, if we can kind of end up in this kind of territory, that we really have something. When Barry Levinson was in, that was the game changer because then we could go in these other meetings and right. say, yeah, Barry Levinson's in. And then it just kind of snowballed from there. We met with Steve James. He was fascinated by Iverson. Steve James at that point, you know, he had done Hoop Dreams. Hoop Dreams was only like 13, 14 years old at that point. That was when we were like, this series is going to be a huge deal. The interesting part about meeting with the filmmakers, there's a couple of things we didn't expect. One was that in our heads, it was like, we'll throw all these topics at you and you'll pick one. And what we didn't expect was we'd meet with these people and they'd be like, I've always wanted to do a documentary about this. And half the time it wasn't on our list. We met with Albert Mazels, the famous director. Can't turn that down. Right. I remember well Albert Mazels coming into the office and I think of course this was on everybody's lists of documentarians to work with and they went through a list of pitches that Albert had and stories he was interested in. and I think it was the tail end of the meeting he was walking out and was like and by the way you know I shot with Ali while he was getting ready for this fight and I don't know if it's interesting and it was almost a throwaway comment and it's like oh my god and he goes and I think I have all the footage it's in some warehouse I never ran it we're like what? And that became the, the Muhammad Ali documentary. Jonathan Hawk directed four full-length 30 for 30 documentaries. Among them, Unguarded, which was named Best Documentary of the Year by Sports Illustrated, The Best That Never Was in 2010, Survive in Advance, 2013, and Of Miracles and Men, 2015, which netted Hawk an Emmy for Outstanding Long Sports Documentary. In Rolling Stone's ranking of the 30 best 30 for 30 films, Hawk is the only director to be featured twice in the list's top 10, with Survive and Advance edging the best that never was at numbers 8 and 9, respectively. I got a phone call from Connor Shell saying, we're going to do this project, it's going to be huge, called 30 for 30. We're getting 30 directors to do 30 films about anything they want to, as long as it took place in the last 30 years and has to do with sports. And we want you to be one of the filmmakers. So that was pretty much the best phone call a filmmaker is going to get 
in his life, you know, a big network saying, we're going to pay you to do a film and, and it could be about anything you want. There are a couple of different types of documentaries. There are storytelling documentaries, humanistic documentaries, which is what I'm interested in. And there are journalistic documentaries that are sort of exposés of the food industry or the cigarette industry, you know, things, things that are really important and issue-based. And I feel compelled for whatever compels us in life to tell stories that are smaller in scale. And when these stories are real, and it's actually a person, like Marcus Dupree is probably the best example. I mean, here's a guy who sort of meant so much to me when I was 18, 19 years old and the same age that he was, and what he symbolizes, this raw human potential, and how my imagination, so many others were captured by him, and then for him to disappear, I'm just so personally drawn to that kind of story. Like, what happened to this individual human being? When Connor originally told me about 30 for 30 and how we're not doing, he said, the best basketball players that ever lived or the, of the last 30 years, or the best games of the last 30 years, the best running backs of the last 30 years. And I said to him, well, if we're not doing the best that ever was, what about the best that never was? Because the story of Marcus Dupree had been on my mind for a long time. And he said, what do you mean? I said, Marcus Dupree would have been the best running back of the last 30 years, but it didn't work out. And Connor said to me, who's Marcus Dupree? And I said, wow, now we really have to do it. And Bill Simmons remembered Marcus well, being a little closer to my age. And then we had to find Marcus, and nobody knew where he was. Nobody from his past knew where he was. Nobody in Philadelphia, Mississippi knew where he was. Nobody in his former workplaces knew where he was. And after six months of trying to find him, ESPN was getting a little impatient. <laughs> you know, you better find your subject if you're going to make one of these films. And I hired a private investigator who found it, and his name came up in some marriage records in, in Orlando or something. We traced him down to this very tiny little one-room church in Tallahassee, Florida, and uh, found him. And I got him on the phone, and I said, Marcus, you don't know how happy I am to speak to you. And he said, well, I'm happy to speak to you, too. And he explained that he wasn't hiding. He was just living his life. And that sort of humility and grace that he has was apparent from our first meeting. Obvious as it may sound, documentaries are not like magazine features. They need pictures and footage and everything else possible to make the story come alive on the screen. The key to the Marcus Dupree film was finding the footage of him in high school. Uh, one of my old friends from NFL Films, where I used to work, said it was like the shark in Jaws. Like It could be a really good movie, but if you don't have the right shark, then the whole thing is not going to work because the shark has to really be that scary for everything else to ring true and to mean something. And if, if we weren't able to show Marcus being this running back unlike any high school running back ever, then would have been much more hollow as a story. And, you know, we just were literally knocking on doors in Philadelphia, Mississippi, and until someone had a memory of the quarterback from the team that Marcus played on having taken film cans from the school when he graduated and we ended up tracking him down in, in a, a little cabin in rural eastern Mississippi and, and we put the film up on the reels and, and looked at it and it was like it was like a dream come true it was like oh my god it's real like all these stories about Marcus in high school it was real when we had that I knew we had a film as it turned out, a bigger film than we had bargained for. It was supposed to be 50 minutes, and the first rough cut I turned into to ESPN was 94 minutes, I remember, because it was so outrageously long. But I thought everything in it was great and thought it played as a story at that length. And so I just sent it over, and I told them, look, I know this has to be 50 minutes. I'll get it down. Just wanted you to see what I have. And got a call back from John Dahl, and John said, well, what do you think about this at 94 minutes? I said, well, I like it, but I know it has to be 50. He said, no, we like it too. We want it to be this long. We tried to do all the hard work up front. Like let's, in the sort of development process, let's get 
all of the issues on the table that we are interested in. And let's talk through everything we think is going to be hard. And let's talk about the three-act structure and the beginning, middle, and end of this story. And if you have all those conversations and you can get to a place where everybody sees what this is going to be, then we would say, okay, here's your budget. We're not going to pick over each little line item of it. We've got a set amount of money that goes for fees and expenses for this. Go make the thing. And we'll talk to you when you have a first rough cut, unless you need us in between. And then each project manager would, you know, they'd check in every couple weeks. Just how's it going? Are there any pitfalls that anything you're concerned about? How's your timetable looking, et cetera? And those conversations were sometimes, as I said, regular. Sometimes they were sporadic. But we tried to give then infinite rope to the filmmaker's vision up until they had a rough cut of the whole thing. And then if we needed to really dig in and change course or whatever, that was when that would happen. It happened far less than it probably should have, though. I mean, we, in that first group of 30, ended up serendipitously with making, I think, really smart choices. We had this process, and this is where John Dahl was really helpful and he's really good at it. Like, we would all give notes, and then John Dahl would kind of, instead of just getting eight emails of notes from eight different people, what we would do is we would have just the one email that had all the notes, and he would kind of determine which ones should be in there. And what I found was I love giving notes, and I was good at it. I just, to me, it was a lot like writing something where you're like, you start out at 2,500 words and it's like, all right, I get to get this down to 2,000. What should go? What should stay? I loved it. And our balance was how do we give notes to people? How do we steer them away from a mistake, but also keeping our agreement to empower the filmmaker? And that was a balance that for the most part, we were really good at. John Dahl, he is one of the most experienced, best producers, I think, working in nonfiction content, period. He has an attention to detail that is second to none. And John sits there and he solves problems for people. And he gives them time codes and he says, if you just take out this, maybe you can get from here to here better. And we had no sense of this going into it, but I always thought that John, Bill, and I were a great team together on that because we all sort of complemented each other from how we thought about things creatively. So how did Bill think about things? Bill thought really big picture. I've always thought that one of the things that makes Bill great at being, let's call him just a sort of great generator of ideas, is that Bill is sort of unburdened by what's actually practical, right? I mean, that as a huge compliment. He says, says, well, why not? Let's do it this way. You can think about it this way. And they didn't get into these five things that I thought were so interesting. Like, you know, and, and then you have to sort of marry that with, well, okay, maybe you couldn't get the interview subjects to talk about that, or maybe there's not source footage that actually gets you logically to that idea, or maybe it doesn't fit with the narrative. But I think Bill has an incredible connection with his audience, so he knows what people are inherently interested in, and then he also has this really good sense of, of, as I said, these sort of big picture ideas that can resonate and make things interesting. And when you sort of couple that with John Dahl's attention to detail and attention to what's practical, I felt like we were always able to give really thoughtful comments and notes and feedback to filmmakers. I tried very hard to incorporate Bill's notes. (laughs) I really did because, look, it started with Bill. Can you think of a time, though, when you guys disagreed? Was there... (sighs) Um, Yeah, sure, we disagreed sometimes. I don't know. I mean, it's not like every note was implemented from Bill. Right. For I mean, example, he didn't like the, the Bernie and Ernie film we did in volume two. Like, you know, just that film wasn't what he envisioned for it. And that's okay. That's okay. So, yeah, we disagreed sometimes. But Bill was good about, like, he would give his notes. And he, I think he knew that I strongly would consider and try to implement. But sometimes, for whatever reason, it maybe still didn't pan out exactly the way he envisioned it. But he respected that. But he was who okay. had, um, for lack of a better word, final cut? Let's just say that there's a two-minute scene. Mm-hmm. And you think they're wonderful. And Bill thinks it makes him carsick. And <laughs> Connor, let's just be true to Connor, and Connor can see both the good yeah. and the bad of it. <laughs> and Connor's great about okay, that. <laughs> right? So what happens to those two minutes? Those two minutes would stay if the filmmaker and I thought they were working in the end. 
Because Bill was not like on the finishing end. You know, like he was, I think he and Connor would leave that part to me. Like I was focused on making the trains run on time, getting the films to time, getting them segmented properly, all the surround material. Like in the end, Connor and Bill knew that was my responsibility. Here's John Walsh. I did the best I could. And, you know, you always do the best you can in whatever the situation is. And frequently it worked and sometimes it didn't. And there are all kinds of clashes from time to time. I certainly had them with different people along the way at different times. It's the nature of a creative enterprise that there are going to be different versions and different visions and different senses of what the quality is. And so it's just part of what you do when you're in management. You try to do the best you can. You know, I'm especially open to startups. I'm especially open to trying something different and seeing if it works. And there are things that don't work. When you get notes from the people who work on 30 for 30, they were always great notes. And they always made whatever the project was just a little bit better and sometimes substantially better. I had a, an exercise which I was very fond of, and that was, okay, there were probably 10 of us who had seen every documentary. And so all 10 of us had a vote, one through 30. What was the best and what was the worst? I had originally done it at ESPN Magazine. Every six months, I would go to New York and throw the magazines from the last six months down and say, okay, pick the three best pick the three worst and what does that tell you about what you're doing and we did the same thing with the 30 for 30 which was very competitive and it was very difficult because the high high quality of the films i've seen every rough cut of every 30 for 30 you know through the last several years up until just very recently so i would literally watch every rough cut of every film and sometimes there's multiple rough cuts. It can be anywhere from, you know, three or four to <laughs> nine or ten, honestly. I believed, and if we're going to give feedback to the filmmaker, that we needed to be specific. That I couldn't just say, hey, I don't like this. Hey, more of that. I saw my job as being like, in a way, the bad guy. <laughs> I have to deliver sometimes the... <laughs> The bad news, the hard news, like, here's how specifically it can be better. Now, I understand people seeing those notes as prescriptive. I think that's true. Do you remember looking at a rough cut of something early on and give us an example of maybe something, you know, that reflects your thought process and what you communicated to the filmmaker? There were two. They're related in the first wave of films. There was the Steve James film on Allen Iverson, No Crossover. The Trial of Allen Iverson. And there was the film on Len Bias dying without bias with Kirk Frazier directing. They are related in this way. Both needed a lot of, I thought, intervention. I think, and I wasn't alone. I mean, I, right. you know, I, I wouldn't do something where Bill and Connor say, it's perfect, and I'm sitting there like trying to change it. We thought it needed a lot of work. And this is Steve James. I mean, this is the Hoop Dreams director. You know, <laughs> how do you right. tell Steve James that, you know, his film is just not where we want it right now? First of all, it didn't have Iverson. And a few years earlier, we'd actually explored a project that Iverson was doing himself or was, you know, interviewed for, and it just never came together. So we knew Iverson wasn't going to speak for the film. I thought what Steve was doing was bringing his personal experiences with his home family to the story of that brawl that led to Alan Iverson going to prison for a while, what that incident at the bowling alley did to the rest of his you know, life and career. We had no gravitas at all to battle somebody like Steve James. The Iverson one I loved, it was too long. It should have been shorter, and we were nobodies. We didn't have the standing at that time to be like, this would really help the documentary if it was shorter. If you just tighten this, if you took this out, this out, we weren't going to tell Steve James anything. So that's where you'd get in a little trouble was, like, we gave that one more. But for the most part, the first ones were always an hour. And in my opinion, that was a good thing. And I think the biggest mistake they've made, especially with this last series, is they're doing them for the time slot now, not for the quality of the doc. So just be like, hey, two hours. All right, fill the two hours. And most documentaries should be an hour, maybe an hour and a half max. If you're going to go two hours, it's got to be great. It's got to be like two Escobars or it's got to be um, even something like Fab Five. When I think of how they run their operation, it's Connor specifically, but it's John and Libby, they're there to be as supportive and as helpful as you want them to be. 
and they are respectful enough to let you be when you want to be left alone. And I think that they're strong enough in their opinions and in their ambitions for making good films that if they're working with people that it's not working for them, that they will intercede. And so I do think the fluidity with which they go about doing their work and working on the films is very impressive. To be honest, I don't know how Connor ever really had the bandwidth to sort of keep his fingers on things when, you know, there are that many films in production at one time. But like they seem to work out a system that works. They're pretty good with how they go about doing things. And so I feel like Connor's strength is that he solves problems. He makes the problems that seem big to you smaller. And that's a very nice thing if you're, you know, working with him as a filmmaker. It was really different coming from physical production, a small production company where you're just hands are constantly dirty, you're sleeping in the edit, you're really involved in the day to day to going to the network side. And I now think that was so valuable because when I talk to filmmakers about budgets or timelines or just anything you're asking for, we need you to create a trailer by tomorrow. It's like, that's not how that works. I feel like I can speak that language. But it was a real transition going to the network because I started as an associate producer and that definition is so different at a network, right? I was sitting in a cubicle on 34th Street every day and I was calling our producers and saying, how can I help? What support do you need? Can I pull footage for you? Are you on budget? Do you need, I don't know, Dick Vitale's phone number? (laughs) You know, it was a supporting role. And I kind of love being able to support these filmmakers and being in this position. When I made a film at HBO, I was working for the sports department at HBO. And my name was on the film as a producer of the film, not a director of the film, even though I directed the film. And there were certain politics that went along there in terms of the machine under which I was working. And when the films were made, I think HBO was incredible in marketing Ghost of Flatbush. They're incredible in marketing Magic and Bird. Again, you know, for me, there's like, you don't know what you don't know. It's just like, this is great for me. But in essence, for me, the culmination of those things would be a screening or two that is organized, one or two, and that's what you get as far as your access to the world. And in some ways, like, if you're there, someone kind of knows you did it, but in some ways you're a soldier, you know, in service of this larger, you know, operation. But HBO is HBO. They market the hell out of these things. So you know you're going to have a film that's going to be played multiple times on HBO and will be on demand. But there's just not the same sort of connection to you as the individual making the thing. Maybe there's a little bit of ego involved and frustration that comes with that. But by the way, there was no other recourse and it was still great. But the difference is then when you go and you do something at ESPN, getting back to the notion that they're much more filmmaker driven, when you make a film, it's, oh, you it's a film directed by Ezra Edelman and they promote that. And so they're promoting the work, but they're also promoting you as a filmmaker. And so now you feel more connected to a filmmaking community at at large because someone goes, Oh, there's someone who made that thing. I really say this without trying to take a shot at all at HBO because I just can't speak enough about that environment that was fostered there. And again, the group of us as storytellers and documentary filmmakers and that environment that we shared was second to none. And the work that we did, I think, is second to none. And I believe that. But it's just interesting how it worked out for me evolutionarily. You know, at a certain point, there was an antsiness. On Tuesday, October 6th, 2009, 30 for 30 made its official television premiere with King's Ransom, directed by Peter Berg. The film looked back compellingly at Wayne Gretzky's 1988 trade from the Edmonton Oilers to the Los Angeles Kings. I think part of why 30 for 30 took off was the way we did the presentation. Like, John Skipper, he was just so committed to making this a success. He gave us incredible support. And one of those things is limited commercial interruption. I mean, that's a real investment that the company has to make. Connor and I felt strongly like, you know, three commercial breaks in an hour. The normal ESPN format is like six commercial breaks. You're like, if you are going to sit down and watch a film and you are being broken up five, six times in an hour or, you know, more than that, you're not going to get into the story. The other thing that I felt was really important, this was kind of a pet issue for me, and I still believe it to this day, actually, was I didn't want a bottom line on the screen. And the first time I advocated for that hard was the greatest game ever played. That was like a pet project of mine on the 58 Colts-Giants championship game. And we colorized the footage and we got Colts and Giants from now and from 50 years ago together to watch it. And that was our post-Heisman documentary in 2008. And that was the first time we did No Bottom Line 
during a documentary. And I felt like if they start reading the bottom line, they won't get engaged in your story. And I felt like limited commercial interruption, no bottom line, these things like help contribute, in my opinion, to making it a really pleasurable viewing experience for the audience. Because Connor would always say, documentaries are not medicine. You know, when you say documentary like 10, 15 years ago, oh, okay, it's good for you. You know, take your medicine. Yeah. You need to watch this. And it was like, no, documentaries can be entertaining, compelling, make you feel a variety of emotions. So we finish the first six, we plan out what the first six are going to be. And it's running, I think it was like October 5th or October 6th, something like that. And it's a Tuesday night and we're going against a divisional baseball playoff game. And I am on my book tour now. I'm about to go try to sell my book as 30 of 30 is happening. And uh, the Monday night is Brett Favre returning to Lambo. Brett Favre returning to Lambo Monday night, the day before 30 of 30 launches. And we're thinking like, this is amazing. This is going to be the biggest audience ESPN has ever had for a sporting event in the last couple of years. And it's the night before our show and they, they're going to promote it. They didn't run a single ad. Tariko at one point came out of a commercial and it was like, hey, coming up 30 for 30 tomorrow night and launches our new ambitious documentaries or whatever. And then just goes to the football game. And Connor and I were like, what the fuck? Like, <laughs> this is the biggest platform you have. Like, think about how they promote shit now with like, you right. know, the six and the SVP at midnight. But and had you whatever. gone to them and said, by the way, we need. Oh, yeah. And for that one, we were like, hey, you guys are going to take care of us, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, we're going to. So I still feel like there was an element of the company that was kind of just not behind it because they had no incentive to be behind it. Right. It was an idea that belonged to a couple of people and Skipper and Walsh. And there were these other parts of the company that weren't totally sold on the idea. So I found this email. I don't think I've shared this with you. So. Tuesday, October 6, 2009. That was the day 30 for 30 launch. 10.57 a.m. I sent this email to all of my friends and everybody I worked with. Blind CC. The subject was Dear Everybody. ESPN premieres our 30 for 30 series tonight at 8 p.m. Basically, we have went out and found 30 filmmakers to make 30 stories about the 30 years since ESPN launched. I co-created the series with my friend Connor, and I am also one of the executive producers. We've been working on the project since February of 2007. Sadly, ESPN decided to show just one 10-second ad for it during the entire Packers-Vikings game because, God forbid, we bumped a college game day ad or a Sports Center umpire ad with Scott Van Pelt. So I am forced to rely on viral email marketing so you know that it starts tonight. Ah, the irony. Tonight's film is by Peter Berg. It's about the Gretzky trade, and it's really good. Anyway, I hope you watch. Thanks for reading. Here are a couple of reviews. And I did the Alan Sepinwall ad age New York Times. Then it said, thanks, Simmons. <laughs> I said that to everybody I knew. That's how little they promoted it. We were fucking pissed. So it comes out. It's going against a baseball game. We're rooting for the game to end. It's the only thing that's on that night. And if the game's dragging along. And we're watching on Twitter. Every, at that point, Twitter had become a thing. And we're pushing the series on Twitter. But everyone on Twitter is just talking about this baseball game. Because it's single elimination. And we're like, wow, worst case scenario, this game goes into extra innings. It goes into extra innings. So the game is in extra innings during the first 40 minutes of this Gretzky one. I'm tweeting, hey, we know it's an extra innings playoff game right now, but our 30 for 30 is launching right now. It was just like the worst luck. We were, we were so bummed out. <laughs> the rating wasn't very good for the first one. And the ratings weren't good for the first few. They just weren't. I, I think people didn't trust ESPN completely. And so those doubters within ESPN, were they ready to pull Yeah, they were like, look at the ratings. But Skipper and Walsh didn't care because they loved the concept and they loved... And the reviews were good. And the reviews were good. The ratings on all of those were smaller than they should have been because we hadn't built the equity yet with the audience, right? We were new to the space. We were telling people, you should pay attention to what we're doing. But that's a big ask when it's a totally new type of content you're putting out. And it just took a while for us to kind of build that equity. Frankly, I wasn't so sure, you know, does an ESPN or the sports audience have the appetite to sit down for, God forbid, 50 minutes or 100 minutes to go back in time and really get a historical look or contextual look on some of these bigger stories. I'm sure, especially for Bill and Connor, it was risky and scary. But for us, it was like the world is our oyster. It took a while for it to get going. And I don't remember what the turning point was. I think like the Clores one about Reggie Miller was great. 
the Escobar's one was probably the one where people were like, holy shit, this series is really great. Because that was like, uh, I mean, from a degree of difficulty slash those guys, the, the uh, Zimbalists, they go to Colombia, they do all this in nine months, they're doing the translators. Like, it's fucking impossible. That should take in three years to do that. So that's when the series got momentum. For me, it was great because, you know, I helped obviously create the series and figure out what was on and bouncing like which things and the, should this be in there, that be in there. It was really fun. And we were trying to straddle this balance of we were trying to empower the creators and the filmmakers and not metal because we promised them like these are going to be your things. Look, it was exhilarating, right? I mean, we knew we had some good concepts and that we had some quality filmmakers early on. The Peter Berg Gretzky movie was made and it was really good. And then it was a rush because it was a year long of here's sort of the schedule. Is this one ready? Not ready. It's an astonishing amount of work. And as they kept coming, they kept being good. We just didn't have many duds. Uh, I mentioned the Escobar movie. I mean, when we got that, that was an extraordinary sort of moment where we knew what a good film we had. And by the way, oddly enough, of course, Donald Trump was in the original 30 for 30. As Mike Tolan did a documentary on his ownership of the New Jersey Generals, which was quite good. Then you hit the proverbial fork in the road, which is, uh, are we going to keep on doing this? Uh-huh. Well, we uh, remember we had the brand ESPN Films, right? and we had made Black Magic, and we made another couple of films. So what we assumed was next year we'd go back to ESPN Films. And I don't think it was a long decision-making process. We did, I believe, exactly zero market research. So we go through the first series, we win a Peabody. We always thought we had a chance to win an Emmy, maybe, a sports Emmy or whatever. But the Peabody was like, that's for Bodenheimer. So we have the Peabody thing. We go, we accept it. And Bodenheimer went, this is the guy who's run the whole company. And he was so proud of us. And he was so proud of 30 for 30. He had sent us notes. I mean, he is an unbelievable boss. He had sent us notes how proud he was to run the series, how great he thought it was. But then he actually showed up for the Peabody thing. And that's where we were like, wow, we, we did it. And there are two other things that were going on. One is that all of a sudden, all the filmmakers wanted to be in it. So we went from couldn't get anybody, could barely get meetings, to how do I get one of these? How can I get in? Is it too late? Did you fill the 30 left? And it was like real people. So that was awesome. And then um, the reviews and the word of mouth. You could see the ratings go up the DVR season pass, stuff like that. It was just working. And we knew it was working because Ross Greenberg, who was running HBO at the time, gave this really pissy interview about how, well, they know we own the space or whatever. And I remember I went back at him on Twitter and mocked yeah, that was them. Fun. Which is like, they would always say, oh, Simmons is loose cannon. But that's where I was perfect because they couldn't say it. But, you know, like Skipper's like sending me emails. That was great. I loved when he went to Greenberg because he was a blowhard. And he felt like they owned the space. I was like, we were taking the space from them. I started to realize that we could do 300 of them and that the sports world's incredibly dynamic and things are happening all the time that lead you to thinking something else is interesting. And and it started to snowball in this way where it was really apparent to everyone involved that this was a construct that worked and we should keep doing it. So the series is coming to an end, and we're like, let's do more. We have more ideas, more filmmakers want to work for us. At that point, Keith and Joan were in charge, and they did not want the series to continue. In 2009, Joan had gotten more power, and she decided to make 2010 the year of the quarterback. Do you remember this? Mm -hmm. Which was this whole documentary series and shows about the quarterback positions. This is happening independently of us, and it's kind of like our rival. And it was weird. And it was, it was like, we're already doing all these things. Why do I have to do more stuff? But it was, so that became her thing. And as we headed toward the wind down of the series, they just didn't want to do it. And not only did they not want to do it, they wanted to get rid of the brand. So there's this little weird, maybe like nine months to a year, where we're making 30 for 30s, but not calling them 30 for 30. They were called ESPN Films Presents. And Keith, who is a nice guy, but Keith just didn't want to continue the brand. It wasn't his idea. He wasn't there when we when we innovated it. So he wanted to call it ESPN Films Presents. He wanted to make ESPN Films the brand. There were never any guarantees that 30 for 30 would survive past the first round of films. And those who were unsupportive of the series in the first place were counting down the months until the project would disappear. 
But the documentary unit had fallen in love with the films, with the filmmakers, and with the creative and largely independent world that they had created for themselves. And they didn't want to stop. Could the forces aligned against them prevail this time and orchestrate an end to 30 for 30? Or would the cavalry come charging around the bend, ride to the rescue, and bring a new lease on 30 for 30's life? Those answers, plus Simmons' exit from ESPN, the birth of OJ's Made in America, and more when Arjun's 30 for 30 continues with part two.